Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webcast this morning, uh, where we're going to be talking about how you can complement Cisco Umbrella with cloud app and data security. I'm Meg Diaz, and I'm on the product team for Cisco Umbrella, and I'm joined by my colleague, Michael Gleason. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. And he'll be uh, covering CloudLock um, and giving you a, a bit of a, an overview of that. So what we'll plan to cover today, um, I'll, I'll get things started and, and give a little bit of background um, uh, on you know, the security challenges and the, the landscape and, and what Cisco has been doing in this area. And then I'll turn it over to Michael to go into more detail around CloudLock. So if we look at kind of the, the current state and, and what you're probably uh, very aware of and, and facing today, um, with the way that our employees work has really changed. And what we've been looking at a lot is, you know, has your security changed along with that? And what we mean by that is, you know, if you think about traditionally, perimeter security used to be effective. You would, you would protect your, your headquarters, you would have your security stack there, you would have your branch offices, backhaul traffic, and still get that protection. And that's really, you know, how IT was built, where your critical infrastructure, your business apps, and your data, and your, your desktops were all housed inside the, the, the uh, headquarters and, and protected by uh, the perimeter and, and the security that you had there. But what we're seeing today, and, and you're probably facing this as well, is that you have a lot of your critical infrastructure starting to move to the cloud, as well as your business applications. So you're using Salesforce.com and Office 365 and other cloud apps. So you have your data now um, housed in those areas. And the good thing is that that's making it easier for users to access that data and work from anywhere. So you have, you know, roaming laptops that, you know, no longer need to connect to the VPN. They can just work from anywhere. And then we also see um, branch offices starting to, to connect more directly to the Internet instead of backhauling. Um, and what, that, what that's causing, though, is the, the Gartner estimates that by 2018, 25% of corporate uh, traffic will bypass perimeter security. And so, you, you know, how do you, how do you still make sure that you provide protection everywhere? And that's really what, you know, OpenDNS was traditionally um, designed, OpenDNS umbrella was traditionally designed to do. And Cisco uh, recognized these, these changes and acquired OpenDNS, which um, hopefully a lot of you are, are familiar with the brand change that we went through back in November, where umbrella is now Cisco umbrella. And Cisco also acquired CloudLock. Um, to, to help with protecting those, those apps and the data and the users um, that are because the, uh, with the data and, and apps now in the cloud, how do you protect all of those? And Umbrella, um, as you all are, are very familiar with, is, is really about helping you protect users wherever they access the Internet. So helping to defend against malware, phishing, and, and command and control callbacks. And providing that first line of defense wherever users access the Internet. And CloudLock is a very complementary product because it's allowing you to gain visibility and control to really be able to secure your cloud apps and infrastructure. And so I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael to talk a bit more about CloudLock. But, you know, CloudLock is a, a CASB, um, which is a cloud access security broker. And I'll, and I'll turn it over to, to Michael now to give you a little bit more detail on that. Awesome. Thanks very much, Meg. Thank you, everyone, for joining us online. Hopefully everyone's having a good Thursday so far. So Michael Gleason, Product Marketing Manager from CloudLock. And what I'd like to talk to everyone about today a little bit is CloudLock, the cloud access security broker market at large, cloud security challenges and the use cases that emerge from those, and kind of how we, we see those challenges and how we look to address those challenges. Um, moving on. And the reason we're really speaking today is that CloudLock and OpenDNS now Cisco Umbrella have extraordinarily uh, complementary philosophies when it comes to redefining what a security tool looks like and feels like, that it doesn't have to be a physical box for starters, um, but also that it, it doesn't have to be a painful process to deploy or to operationalize. And increasingly we see that organizations are resource strapped when it comes to their IT departments, their security departments, and the last thing we want to do is introduce burdensome complex tools that take months to deploy and have steep learning curves. Um, so we're really excited to work together to offer security solutions that complement each other through this less operationally intensive approach 
um, that can protect your organization in a pretty efficient, pain-free way. And in the cloud, when we talk about cloud security, we're really talking about a shared responsibility model. Uh, this graphic comes from Gartner. And essentially, it, it showcases the fact that in the cloud, the infrastructure is typically taken care of by the vendor. Um, but that leaves organizations and security professionals ultimately responsible to secure the users, the data, and in some cases, the applications, uh, primarily meaning their usage. And oftentimes, when I'm out in the field speaking to security executives, I, I get a question along the lines of, well, isn't Salesforce secure? Isn't Dropbox secure? And of course, those organizations do a terrific job securing their infrastructure, their data centers, but ultimately, they're not providing the level of security control and capabilities that you would need to confidently adopt these cloud applications, particularly for organizations con uh, concerned about sensitive data, regulated data, and compliance. Um, and quick shout out around the weaknesses of these cloud service providers. Typically, they're single platform only, meaning that sure, maybe a box has some simple DLP functionality, but you don't get the simplicity of uh, and benefit of being able to deploy policies across multiple cloud applications from one centralized platform, nor do you have the opportunity to correlate insights across these different platforms. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get to our user and entity behavior analytics capability. Additionally, these native cloud service provider functionality offers uh, capabilities that solve fewer problems. It's kind of uh, whack-a-mole in terms of, sure, this application provides some basic DLP, but they don't really have any user and SED behavior analytics to detect potentially compromised accounts, um, nor do they have capabilities to detect shadow IT or connected applications. And additionally, most of these service providers have a lack of security expertise and focus, and of course, to them, security isn't a core competency, but a check-the-box exercise that allows them to go to market without uh, interruption from security challengers. Additionally, there's typically an upcharge associated with a lot of the security functionality offered by native cloud, uh, cloud applications, and it's typically better to just redirect that, uh, that operational spend towards a, uh, a dedicated security solution. Um, additionally, limited incident management or no incident management in a lot of these, so your security analysts and operations teams are just going to have a nightmare of a time trying to actually triage and manage the incidents should, it, uh, should these applications have any basic security functionality to begin with, and weak remediation capabilities in the sense that for the few applications that may be able to tell you there is a security violation, uh, you're, it's kind of up to you to actually go and remediate that rather than leveraging the automated remediation capabilities that most cloud security solutions uh, provide. And ultimately, this leaves organizations with a series of questions around those users' data and apps going back to that shared responsibility model. And when we talk about users, most frequently I hear questions around, how can I tell what users are doing in my cloud applications? How do we detect anomalous activity that might be indicative of account compromise? And how do we correlate that information across cloud applications to detect anything that might be suspicious? When it comes to data questions, just like traditional on-premises DLP, but in the cloud, do we have sensitive information going to cloud platforms? And if so, how can I detect that? And perhaps more importantly, how can I remediate and how can I respond to that um, in an automated fashion that doesn't burden my security team with, with a tremendous amount of work? And on the application side, uh, we talk about shadow IT all the time or shadow productivity. Ultimately, end users are typically just looking to be productive. They're not looking to cause damage to the organization that uh, give them a paycheck, but we do want to be able to detect how are our users uh, self-enabling applications, are they connecting them to corporate systems in the form of third-party apps, and we'll dive into that a little bit later in the presentation. And when I detect these applications that might pose an excessive risk to my organization, how do we revoke those accordingly? So right now we're going to dive a little deeper into these three use cases and showcase some of the insights that we've gathered through working with our customers and, inter, uh, and being out in the field and some of the insights we've gleaned from our cyber lab. We have a dedicated team that essentially uh, takes anonymized data from our customer base and looks at trends and it allows us to give some insight both back to customers uh, but also to our internal team and gain more intelligence around what's really going on in the cloud security market. So going back to users, without CASB, um, cloud access security brokers like CloudLock, companies are blind to the most obvious malicious traffic. So what we see here in this graphic is a user logging in from multiple cloud applications from unique locations over a short period of time. 
and without a single source of intelligence to ingest all that information, there's no way to really correlate those insights to detect account compromises. So Box could tell you that someone logged in from South America at 10.02 a.m., and Dropbox could tell you the same user logged in from Alaska at 10.03 a.m., but without a source ingesting and analyzing all those insights to aggregate them, you'd never be able to tell that that was indicative of account compromise. And it's a challenge for security teams to find this proverbial needle in a haystack. Um, we've discovered that roughly one in 5,000 user activities is suspicious. And if your security team is anything like the ones I speak with on a regular basis, they're just inundated with alerts. Um, we see here that there's over 5,700 monthly suspicious activities per organization. And the question for us becomes, how do we turn a suspicious activity into a definitive judgment as to whether or not that activity is worth investigating, worth responding to, or merely was slightly atypical but nothing alarming. And this led to us developing a model that we call the cloud threat funnel, where essentially we have to look at all user behavior and then filter that down to anything that might be anomalous in nature, such as in, you know, an increase in login failure, perhaps uh, file download at a rate that exceeds typical patterns for that user, and then take anomalies to determine whether or not that represents true suspicious activity, and then filter that down further to identify the true threat. And without doing this, uh, or with doing this without an automated tool um, that offers the kind of threat intelligence and centralized policies that a CASB offers is a true challenge for a typical security team. When we talk about data, again, this is much like DLP on the on-premises world, but in the cloud, it's a little different. On-prem, blocking was kind of your one chance to stop the data before it exfiltrated the organization. But in the cloud, it's completely different in the sense that the perimeter is perforated, it's expanded, an increasing amount of users are connecting directly to cloud applications and accessing uh, those cloud applications off the network. And being able to detect those externalization of sensitive files uh, in the cloud is pr uh, particularly difficult. And we know that the very nature of network traffic itself has changed. So we see a growing amount of content created directly in the cloud. Um, this is data that might never traverse the corporate network. Additionally, we see a growing volume of cloud-to-cloud -cloud traffic. So think of a Marketo talking to a Salesforce, for instance, or maybe your Dropbox um, system is synced with Salesforce. Those communications are never going to traverse the corporate network. So if you have a proxy-based solution or a network-centric security solution, they just can't measure up to a cloud security solution that actually integrates with the cloud directly to detect uh, the sensitive data flow. We've discovered that roughly one in four users violate a policy, and I always like to add the caveat that this is among the CloudLock customer base, which would presumably be more forward-thinking security-conscious organizations. So I shudder to think at a, at a less progressive organization or a, a company that doesn't have a cloud security solution in place at this time, what that percentage could look like. And we've seen that over 24,000 files per, or, uh, per organization are publicly accessible. And we have to remember that in cloud applications, particularly EFSS, which is uh, enterprise file sync and share applications, so think of your box, your Dropbox, essentially your file repositories, it's so easy for users to uh, share with external parties, whether those are partners or personal accounts, but it's also particularly easy for them to make files not only externally accessible, but publicly accessible. So in G Suite, for instance, you can make a, a file publicly accessible where it's actually indexable by Google. So clever, malicious parties have actually taken to search engines to uh, discover sensitive information um, exposed by organizations through cloud applications. The good news is that there's uh, the Malcolm Gladwell law in effect here, in effect here where 1% of users represent a highly disproportionate amount of cloud risk. Um, and at first, it can seem like this is overwhelming and difficult to tackle. But the good news from this set of data is that you can remediate an overwhelming amount of your risk, for instance, 73% of your file exposure, by focusing on that 1% of active users. Of course, to do that, a cloud security tool comes in handy. Now we'll move on to the apps use case a little bit, what people commonly refer to as shadow IT. So we've seen an explosion of not only cloud applications, but what we call connected third-party applications. And this has led to a new threat vector, which we, re uh, we refer to as cloud-native malware. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So those of you who are familiar with um, 
Google, Microsoft, uh, Azure AD as an ecosystem like this as well, know that there's a number of applications that sit on marketplaces that connect into these corporate sanctioned applications. Um, and you're all familiar with the process of going to a website and you have the opportunity to either log in with fresh credentials or you can simply log in with Google, log in with Facebook, and that's leveraging OAuth authorization. So essentially it's, it's like a form of federated identity and you're having the, uh, the sanctioned application, the corporate sanctioned application, vouch for your identity. The issue with that is oftentimes these connected applications have excessive permission scopes. Sometimes they're relatively benign and intense, but oftentimes they leverage excessive permissions, and the end result is you're handing your credentials over to a third party and giving them, in some instances, unfettered access to your sensitive information, um, which is a roll of the dice that most security folks I speak with aren't comfortable with. So we see that over 25% of these applications are actually high risk in nature, and when we talk about risk, we're particularly talking about the permission scopes or access scopes associated with this information that anyone here with uh, G Suite, for instance, or Google Apps um, has endowed their users with the ability to, to uh, engage those applications. So let's take a look at an example and how this is actually weaponized in the wild, so to speak. So here we have Baron Lieger, my charming VP of marketing at CloudLock. Um, so a typical spear phishing attack leveraging this threat vector could look something like this. Maybe the attacker is connected to Baron on LinkedIn. They post as a recruiter. Who doesn't want to uh, connect with a recruiter on LinkedIn? And they see that Baron's attending uh, an upcoming uh, marketing event. They send Baron a letter. They share it to, um, to him in Google Drive, or maybe they even just send it to him in an email that poses to be a, uh, a, a contracting partner from the event and sends an urgent compliance agreement that he needs to sign in order to present at the event. We know Barron's particularly busy, so the likelihood of him vetting this email out to, uh, to an extent that would make most security professionals comfortable is slim to none. So he clicks, and you know the typical user mentality of next, 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 just let me get to the, uh, get to the goal. And they open up an application to the right that's DocuSign. And you can see here just what I was talking about, the ability to log in with, um, with G Suite, with Microsoft Azure AD, LinkedIn credentials, and the like. But if you look at the URL bar, you can see that we actually set up a website called MockUSign. And our team internally actually did this. We set up a fake website called MockUSign. It's amazing how many people fail to look at the URL bar. And made it look and feel like DocuSign. But when you connected this application to your Google environment, we found that users did this all too willingly. We could leverage these excessive permission scopes. So you can see here we drilled down and I can tell you now that very few users actually look at this information. When you see, uh, when you drill down on view and manage the files in your Google Drive, what we're actually seeing is this application is able to not only view all your information, but download your documents, modify documents, copy, edit, delete all the files in Google Drive. And this is a data exfiltration at best, ransomware at worst attack waiting to happen. Plus, I think most people don't even think about what the impact of this, like what could somebody actually do by having these permissions? Yep, absolutely, very true. People typically haven't thought of these third-party apps as a threat factor, um, but it's all too easy because each one of your users are capable of uh, endowing these third-party apps with an excessive set of permissions they can leverage to do whatever they want. And when we look at the example of Pokemon Go, this is a fascinating uh, fact for any technolo uh, technology historian out there, the time to reach 100 million users worldwide. So it took the telephone over 75 years to reach 100 million users, Facebook four and a half years, but when we see Pokemon Go, it took just one month to reach 100 million users worldwide. It's pretty astonishing how quickly these applications can, can be adopted. In fact, we saw that 44% of all organizations have employees who granted access to Pokemon Go using corporate credentials. Corporate credentials. It's pretty astonishing. So not just personal credentials, but corporate uh, credentials. To the point that over 1 in 20 organizations' employees have installed Pokemon Go using corporate credentials. And of course, we all know that Pokemon Go had excessive, um, excessive access scopes initially, and of course they pulled back on those. Um, but for the time being, organizations exposed themselves in the sense that this third-party application that hadn't been vetted out by security had the opportunity to view, edit, modify, uh, download, delete files within organizations' 
uh, G Suite environment. Now that we've talked about the use cases a little bit, I'd like to talk about CloudLock and how we look to address these security challenges. So CloudLock is a cloud access security broker. We play in the very active market of CASPs, and we address these three use cases as follows. So first and foremost, user and entity behavior analytics here on the left. We're talking about compromised accounts and insider threats. And this harkens back to what I was speaking about as far as being able to ingest login behavior, um, application behavior from multiple cloud platforms into a single environment, but then correlate those insights to be able to detect anything that might be anomalous, whether that's geographically disparate logins over a short period of time, or alternately it could be an excessive volume of activity download or behavior outside of corporate, uh, typical corporate business hours. So CloudLock ingests all that information and then runs it through a machine learning engine that allows us to process these events and then be able to determine what's suspicious, but also create automated response actions accordingly. Um, additionally, when we talk about cloud DLP, much like DLP on-premises, but different in the sense that the network perimeter has shifted rapidly, we're able to detect data exposures and leakages and also respond to that. So we offer both out-of-the-box uh, policies that allow you to uh, hunt for PCI information, for instance, or HIPAA information, but we also offer custom policies that you can configure for custom regex, for instance. So if you're in manufacturing or technology, perhaps you have a lot of intellectual property, you're Nike and you're coming out with a new Kobe shoe, you know, there's not an out-of-the-box policy to look for Project Kobe, but you can create a policy to look for that and then be able to really drill down on not only are we looking for instances of sensitive information, but particularly sensitive information when exposed. And then we can leverage automated response actions to hunt for that um, and then respond accordingly. So, for instance, a response action could look like quarantining a file within Box or alternately uh, sending the end user a notification, creating an admin alert, um, and the like. And last and not least, when we talk about Shadow IT and those connected apps, CloudLock is capable of detecting those applications, um, and we actually bring a level of cybersecurity intelligence to our customer base in the form of risk ratings. We also offer peer-reviewed risk ratings, what we call the community trust rating. So essentially, we anonymize and aggregate the behavior of our customers as far as trusting or banning applications, and then present that to your security team so they can make a pretty uh, efficient and informed decision as to whether or not this application should exist in your environment. And I think on, on this point, this is also where we see a lot of the, the synergy between CloudLock and Umbrella. Um, because with with cloud or with a, with Umbrella, we had introduced a cloud services report that gave you uh, that gives you insight into what cloud services might be used across your organization based on what domains people are going to. And that's where you know Umbrella gives you that visibility, but then obviously with with CloudLock, it gives you that ability to really control what users are doing within uh, sanctioned cloud apps. So you kind of have that visibility into all the the shadow IT, and then CloudLock brings in that that more granular control. Absolutely, and Meg did a great job foreshadowing some of the uh, integrations we'll speak about in a little bit, but we see more and more use cases between the two platforms that are increasingly complementary. So a little bit about CloudLock, uh, specifically what we cover. So we cover both SaaS applications and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service platforms. Um, so when we talk about SaaS, we're talking about Office 365 and G Suite, for instance, but also your enterprise file sync and share applications like Box and Dropbox, emerging applications with growing popularity like Slack, but also ServiceNow and Salesforce. On the IaaS and PaaS side, we cover AWS, so we protect the AWS console, but also S3 buckets. The amount of DLP violations we find in the average uh, S3 buckets pretty astonishing and uh, the amount of access to those can be a little frightening, but also force.com. And when organizations ask me to draw a architecture diagram or show an architecture diagram to them, they can't believe how simple this is and that we can showcase it on one slide in big font. Um, so CloudLock's very simple. Unlike inline tools like a proxy, we actually deploy completely via API, which affords us a number of benefits. As you see on the bottom left, not only does that afford us the ability to see beyond managed users, managed devices, and the managed network, but we detect unmanaged user behavior, unmanaged devices, and unmanaged network activity because, again, we're connecting directly into the cloud applications themselves. It also affords us the ability to deploy in minutes um, to cover 
massive organizations in quite literally a matter of minutes. Um, but it also affords us the ability to leverage the capabilities native to these cloud applications. So for instance, within Salesforce, you can quarantine a field um, and now CloudLock, because we're API driven, can trigger that as a response action to a DLP violation. Similarly, in Box, for instance, you can quarantine files um, within Box, but now we can automate that through CloudLock such that when we find a DLP policy violation, we can take an automated response to that. And what that allows is increased uh, security for your organization, a superior security posture, but also less security overhead and operational overhead for your organization. Because I've never talked to a security executive who says, you know, we have too many security analysts, uh, too many security analysts, we have too much time on our hands. It's always a matter of doing more with less. And we have subscription customers because we are a SaaS service delivered as a SaaS service across all verticals. Um, you see a number of verticals here, or uh, organizations rather, that are highly regulated. My favorite logo personally is NASA because now we get to claim we protect uh, data intergalactically or at least across the solar system. Um, but we scale to cover 750,000 plus users associated with the Arizona State University environment. Um, a lot of the SaaS applications we cover, including Box, um, actually are customers. So Box uses CloudLock for Box, which is great, even though Box has native DLP functionality. And uh, we can tell a quick customer story here. But to me, if you're familiar with Ahold, uh, it's the brand behind Stop and Shop, Hannaford, Foodline, Peapod, and the like. But my favorite aspect of this quick snapshot case study is uh, David Duquen, who I've had the privilege of meeting in person a handful of times, told us that the biggest benefit of CloudLock is that it keeps them out of hot water. And my favorite part of the quote is, we don't want news channel moments. Um, so Ahold has a number of cloud applications. They're a pretty progressive organization. They're trying to redefine what a large uh, retail brand can look like in terms of agility uh, on the technology side. In order to do that, they adopt a number of cloud applications, but to ensure that they maintain the proper level of visibility into what data is going into that infra, uh, into those cloud applications and then control, particularly over, you think of a retailer, PCI obviously comes to mind, um, they use CloudLock to achieve that. I'll talk briefly about Umbrella and CloudLock and the integration we have so far, uh, right off the bat. We have more integrations planned, but at the moment we're particularly excited about this initial integration we have where CloudLock can detect applications that your users have enabled using those corporate credentials, and then we can block them using corporate credentials. But because we take an API-based approach as opposed to an inline tool approach, we can't offer control over personal credential application use. And this integration allows us to achieve uh, a greater level of control, leveraging the DNS level security that Umbrella offers. When we detect an application that we deem nefarious in the environment and you choose to ban it um, and prevent users from enabling it, you can take an additional action and actually ban the associated domain with the application through Umbrella. So that affords you a level of control uh, both at the OAuth level and the DNS level. And when we remember that you can enforce that control off network through the Umbrella Roaming Security Module for Cisco AnyConnect or alternately the Umbrella Roaming Client, this affords you complete control over both corporate credential use and personal credential use for uh, risky applications. And that integration um, today is, is developed, the, the CloudLock team used the uh, in umbrella enforcement API to to create that. So that's that's how that's done today. Awesome. Okay, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, what I'd recommend checking out is the guide to cloud access security brokers that CloudLock recently released. We'll actually be following up from uh, this webinar today with an email including a link to the cloud access security broker guide, um, and that walks through evaluation criteria if you're looking to make a move and purchase one of these applications, but also serves as a good informational tool just to familiarize yourself with the growing CASB market um, and the use cases associated with cloud access security broker solutions. 